Welcome back to Organic Chemistry 2 Radicals and Polymerization. This time around we'll look at radical stability, selectivity and radical chain reactions. We've mentioned last time that radical reactions are all about comparing bond strengths. Yeah? Um, the bonds which we are uh, breaking and the strength of the bonds which we are making. And there is a very simple rule when it comes to radical stability and that is just about any substituent stabilizes a radical. So let's consider for a moment the reaction of methane with an oxy radical. Yeah? So here we are making a new oxygen hydrogen bond and we are cleaving a carbon hydrogen bond. Yeah? So if we look at the Gibbs free energy of a homolytic cleavage of these bonds we see, okay, delta G for CH is 439 kilojoules per mole. Yeah, so this is a weaker bond, which we are breaking. And um, delta G for the oxygen-hydrogen bond is 498 kilojoules per mole. And we're making, so that means we're making a stronger bond. Yeah. So this reaction will be going forward and is favorable. And now we can think about, and um, uh, just very briefly, this radical, yeah, a carbon-centered radical, uh, which we are generating is, as you see in this explainer box here on the right-hand side, this is now sp2 hybridized, yeah, so it's planar. The uh, radical itself is situated in empty p orbital, yeah. Um, now let's think about uh, a moment about um, the stability um, of such carbon-centered radicals. Yeah? So here uh, we have a delta G values for these CH bonds yeah? um, on uh, substituted carbon centers, yeah? sp3 hybridized carbon centers. So um, here we're looking at a primary carbon. Here we have a secondary yeah, with two methyl groups and here a fully substituted carbon. Yeah? Uh, so this carbon hydrogen is tertiary. Yeah? And you can see yeah, delta G of a homolytic cleavage of these CH bonds um, is 423 in the primary case. 410 in the secondary and 397 in the tertiary. Yeah? So we have a decrease in bond strength as we are introducing more substituents. Yeah? So it means um, you generate the radical yeah, preferentially in the most uh, substituted position. Yeah, let's write it down here very quickly. And you generate the radical preferentially in most in the most substituted position. Yeah. Radicals are also stabilized by conjugation. Yeah. So here you see two examples of an um, allyl and benzyl uh, um, containing molecule. Yeah? So here the delta G uh, for the homolytic cleavage of a CH bond is 364 in the allyl case and delta G CH is 372 kilojoule per mole in the benzyl case. Yeah? 
So this uh, breaking of these bonds is even easier still, simply because the radical species which you are generating then can be fully delocalized across this pi system. Oops, I'll just correct that one. Yeah, so you essentially have a full delocalization of the radical. Yeah. Note though that um, these values are for um, for the sp3 hybridized CH bonds. Yeah. So were you to abstract, for example. Um, a hydrogen which is directly attached to a pi bond yeah so this hydrogen here you generate Yeah, essentially a sigma radical yeah which is uh, very reactive yeah as it is not stabilized by any adjacent orbital overlap as we briefly mentioned on the previous uh, slides, radicals can also be stabilized by electron withdrawing groups. Here we have two compounds, uh, a ketone or acetone yeah, and acetonitrile. Um, and in both cases, you can see um, here the Gibbs free energy of a CH bond here and here is uh, yeah, well roughly equivalent with 385 kilojoule per mole and 360 kilojoule per mole. Now, um, what, is, what is the reason for the stabilization by the electron withdrawing group? Well, there are uh, several ways of uh, thinking about this. I mean, one is uh, thinking about uh, delocalization of a radical into the electron withdrawing group. So it means once you have generated your radical, here, for example, now acetone, You can, analogous to the pyromatic uh, carbon-only system, uh, systems which we discussed previously, you can delocalize this radical into this electron withdrawing group. Doesn't look that great, but you you get the you get the gist. You, so you essentially delocalize this this radical here from the carbon onto the oxygen. Now there is of course an energetic reason, yeah, why uh, why this radical is particularly stabilized. So and to this end, we have to consider the molecular orbitals involved. So uh, let's consider for for a moment here uh, our uh, nitrile radical. You have here your electron withdrawing CN nitrile and here your carbon centered trigonal radical. Now uh, if we look at the uh, um, orbital diagram of this, of this molecule, uh, as we stated previously, uh, the radical is situated in an empty p orbital. But now let's consider for a moment um, the uh, uh, makeup of this carbon nitrogen triple bond. 
So uh, the highest occupied molecular orbital here is our pi with two electrons. However, we also have a pi star. Yeah. And this is a, a very low energy empty orbital here. Now, this low energy pi, pi star orbital is uh, sufficiently close in energy to our p orbital with our single unpaired electron uh, that we get mixing of this pi star and the p orbitals. I forgot that unpaired electron here. There we go. So it means uh, when orbitals are close in, in energy, mixing can occur and indeed it does. So we get a lower lying SOMO or singly occupied molecular orbital in this particular case. And our unpaired electron goes down in energy. Yeah, this lowering of, uh, of energy is, of course, accompanied uh, by stabilization. And what we essentially generate here is an electrophilic radical. Radicals are also stabilized by electron donating groups. So in these instances, we have a, an oxygen and nitrogen with uh, three electron pairs on each. So it means uh, electron donating. Um, if we want to generate a radical uh, from these compounds or cleaving these CH bonds. It's, uh, again, the energetics of these are fairly similar with roughly 385 kilojoule per mole. Um, we can also uh, generate uh, um, stable radicals uh, by direct proximity of uh, the radical to, uh, to an electron donating group like nitrogen. So here again, we have our, um, our uh, lone pair electrons. Um, and this, this radical here is stabilized by the nitrogen. Then you also see in, in the case of tempo, these uh, alkyl groups here. And they have a particular role. Their role is uh, to prevent the dimerization um, of these tempo radicals. Right, but let's consider again the electronics um, of these compounds. So here again, our ether, for example, and our tertiary amine. Um, so we start out again with our uh, uh, the consideration of, uh, of uh, molecular orbitals. So in these cases, we have our SOMO, uh, which is our well, uh, our ele uh, unpaired electron sitting in a p orbital.
and close in energy is our n orbital yeah or our lone pair and here we have on oxygen and on nitrogen two electrons and again mixing happens when two molecular orbitals are close close in uh, in energy and in this particular case we've got three electrons distributed between these two uh, two newly arising molecular orbitals So the overall net change is, yeah, we increase the energy of one electron, but we decrease the energy of two electrons. So the net change is that one electron goes down in energy. So we have stabilization again. Yeah? In this particular instance, we generate a nucleophilic radical. Consider for a moment the radical reaction of isobutene yeah, here on the left with hydrogen bromide. Yeah, we are using a peroxide, um, so a radical in initiator, which we are cleaving by light. Yeah? So all of such uh, reactions um, proceed via three principal steps. Yeah? Initiation, propagation and they can involve termination events and we'll discuss all of these three um, uh, in detail. Uh, this entire cascade is known as a radical chain reaction. So let's have a look at this particular case. Yeah? So the first step, as I mentioned, um, uh, we use our peroxide um, as a radical initiator yeah? and we're using light or heat um, to cleave this peroxide into alkoxy radicals yeah so we can draw in again our molecules and by a fish hook arrows cleave this peroxide bond to give us two alkoxy radicals which will then act as our initiators yeah these uh, relatively stable radicals um, will then abstract hydrogen yeah, from our hydrogen bromide by our radical substitution to give us our bromine radicals. Yeah? So we have our coxy radical breaking this hydrogen brom uh, bromine bond. Yeah? We're forming a stronger oxygen-hydrogen bond yeah, and reforming an alcohol and generating a bromine radical. Yeah. This is now the bromine radical which we are most interested in yeah, to actually start a kick of our reaction. So now our bromine radical can add to our isobutene double bond. And remember what we learned about radical stability. Yeah, we're generating our carbon-centered radical at the most substituted position.
Yeah, so our tertiary radical is the more stable one. Right, now our carbon-centered uh, radical, which we've generated in the previous step, can further abstract a hydrogen from hydrogen bromide. Yes, yeah, so we're forming a new carbon-hydrogen bond, which is very stable and uh, with generating our product. But we're also generating a bromine radical, yeah, which can then go on yeah, and add to another isobutene, for example. Yeah? So this will kick off our radical chain reaction. Now we of course uh, can also have termination events. Yeah? For example, if two bromine radicals find each other in solution, yeah? we will simply regenerate diatomic bromine. Yeah? Or in the case that our bromine substituted um, a radical finds another bromine radical you essentially get di substitution yeah so these uh, termination events um, are rather rare, yeah, but they are frequent, fre frequent enough um, uh, that they are well depleting our radicals. Um, that's why we need uh, more peroxide, yeah, to start this whole chain anew. Let us look at uh, the example of radical halogenation of cyclohexane um, in a little bit more detail. So here we have our cyclohexane and diatomic chlorine, yeah, our Cl2, which we cleave via light to generate our single substituted cyclohexane here, yeah, this halogenated cyclohexane and HCl gas. Yeah. So again, this, uh, this radical reaction um, contains all these three steps initiation, propagation, and termination. So let's have a look at that in more detail. Yeah, as I mentioned, the initiation step is the homolytic cleavage of our chlorine-chlorine bond by a light. Yeah, and we generate our two chlorine radicals. Now this chlorine radical, uh, these chlorine radicals can now go on and abstract one of uh, the hydrogens from our cyclohexane. Yeah, we're cleaving a carbon-hydrogen bond and uh, forming a hydrogen-chlorine bond. Yeah. So in the next step, we're generating our carbon-centered radical and HCl. Yeah. Now our carbon-centered radical can in turn react with chlorine gas, yeah, with our Cl2.
like so we're forming our halogenated yeah, chlorinated cyclohexane and we are reforming a chlorine radical yeah and this chlorine radical now can of course go on and restart this entire propagation step here yeah like so and regenerate uh, abstract a hydrogen and regenerate a carbon radical carbon centered radical and so on yeah of course we have also termination events for example if two chlorine radicals find each other and reform diatomic cl2 or in fact if a carbon radical carbon centered radical or cyclohexene reacts directly with a chlorine radical yeah instead of a cl2 yeah in this case we are still forming our product but we are effectively terminating the chain now cyclohexane has uh, six equivalent carbon uh, centers yeah so selectivity is not much of an issue but we can use the same trick of course to generate other um, halogenation products yeah so here in this case we have uh, three carbons yeah one bridging CH2 and two terminal CH3 carbons and here in this case with our, our isobutane um, we have uh, we have um, three equivalent uh, CH3 carbons and one CH carbon in the center. Now, if you look at the uh, um, distribution of products, yeah, we can e we get 45% of our primary substituted um, product and 55% of a secondary substitution. In this case, we have 63% of a primary substituted product and 37 of the of the uh, um, uh, more highly substituted. Now there are two points to consider when we think about selectivity. Yeah, for one, we have to think about the stability of the uh, um, carbon-centered radicals, which we are generating in the in the uh, in the first propagation step. So as we discussed, of course, the tertiary radical. Yeah. It's more stable, yeah, much more stable than the primary radical, yeah. But we also have to think about the probability that a tertiary radical, yeah, like in the second example here, will be generated in the first place, yeah. So while we have uh, only one tertiary CH bond, yeah, we have nine hydrogens sitting on the ter um, on the uh, on the end groups yeah so this is this is a ratio of one to nine yeah so of course although the primary radical yeah is not the preferred one it is nine times more likely to be ge generated yeah hence the distribution uh, two-thirds to one-third of our um, halogenation products here um, in this reaction. So radical halogenation and yeah, particular radical bromination is a very useful tool for derivatizing um, organic compounds. Yeah? And we can apply this trick of radical bromination um, in terms of allylic bromination, seen here in the top example, and the benzylic bromination. Yeah? Again, um, we are initiating by homolytic cleavage of our bromine-bromine bond to give our uh, two bromine radicals. And then, uh, both in the allylic and the benzylic case, we react at the alpha carbon, yeah? alpha to the, um, to the uh, pi system, yeah? or the um, conjugated pi system in the benzylic case. Yeah, so let us draw in Fishhook arrow me uh, mechanism here again. Yeah, after initiation, we have our bromine radical, which can abstract the uh, hydrogen from the alpha carbon. 
and we're generating our allylic radical here. Now this allylic radical um, can be, uh, as we mentioned a couple of slides or like two lectures ago, can be uh, is relatively stable, yeah, because it can be delocalized into this into this uh, pi bond here, like so. Yeah, and it can immediately also flip back. So now, uh, now this allylic radical can react with a, with another diatomic bromine. Yeah, giving us our allylic bromide as a product and a bromine radical which, as we know, can now restart the chain and abstract another hydrogen from the alpha carbon. Yeah. In the benzylic case, it works analogously. Yeah, well, bromine radical abstracts a hydrogen. We're generating a benzyl radical, yeah, which is now, of course, also stabilized by conjugation. Yeah, so I'm not going to draw all of these fish hook arrows, but you can imagine yeah, that you can delocalize this radical in all kinds of positions within the ring. And now this um, benzyl radical in turn reacts with a Br2. give us our product, the benzyl bromide, and of course our bromine radical, yeah, which restarts the chain. Now there is a competing uh, addition reaction yeah, here, which involves a direct, um, direct addition of bromine to the double bonds, yeah, like so. Hang on, let me just bring up the laser pointer yeah so you would essentially substitute these um, aromatic yeah, or yeah aromatic sp2 hybridized ch bonds here for bromine yeah now this can be prevented if bromine concentration uh, are kept low yeah and how we can achieve this we'll see on the next slide so one way of uh, keeping a handle and control over the bromine concentration in allylic bromination and benzylic bromination is running these two reactions in the presence of NBS. Yeah? NBS stands for N-bromosuccinamide and um, it has two roles in this entire process. Yeah? So you could imagine um, initiation by NBS. Yeah? So here in this case we have a weak nitrogen bromine bond which can be cleaved by heat or light yeah let's draw that in oops all right let's try that again so you can cleave this nitrogen bromine bond uh, generating a very stable delocalized radical here um, on your succinamide and a bromine radical, which is in equilibrium yeah, with a diatomic bromine. Yeah. Now note um, the bromine, yeah, which we need for allylic and benzylic bromination, will still come from uh, this diatomic bromine here. Yeah. So it doesn't come directly from this step. Um, NBS then um, can go on and react with uh, the hydrogen bromide, which we are generating during the um, allylic and benzylic bromination event. Yeah? Now this will be an ionic reaction. Yeah, in this case, we are picking up the proton and generating a, a bromide um, anion and now this bromide anion can react with um, the bromo species on our NBS yeah 
And in this step, we are generating our diatomic bromine. And since um, we took HBr for it, yeah, from this bromination, from the radical bromination step, uh, the bromine, the diatomic bromine, which we are regenerating here, is exactly the same amount of bromine yeah, as allylic radical, which is present in the solution. So, same amount of Br2. As allylic, yeah, or benzylic radicals, yeah. So overall, we find. But in the presence of NBS, um, we generate uh, um, just about enough bromine yeah, to react uh, with the allylic or benzylic radical. Yeah? And other reactions with bromine are avoided. Yeah? So this entire step down here keeps bromine concentration low yeah, and the most favored kinetic process occurs, which is allylic and benzylic bromination instead of a competing reaction of Br2 with the, uh, um, with the uh, CH bonds um, directly adjacent to the pyromatic systems. A radical process plays uh, a role in the pinnacle dimerization of ketones and here we're using magnesium. Yeah, so magnesium is uh, ideal as a two-electron donating metal. Yeah, and it also forms strong magnesium oxygen bonds. Yeah, for further uh, transformations, we're using water. So let's have a look at this process in a bit more detail. Yeah, so magnesium metal um, can donate two electrons, as we as we said. So this is a radical process. In which we're making a strong oxygen magnesium bond and generating a carbon centered radical. So now we still have one uh, electron on our magnesium which can undergo uh, the same process yeah, with another ketone. And now we have um, two carbon-centered radicals held in close proximity by this oxygen-magnesium-oxygen -oxygen bridge. Yeah? And they can form a carbon-carbon bond. Yeah? Now in the presence of water, you will eliminate magnesium oxide and um, generate yeah, this dialcohol, yeah? so a pinnacle. So now, when you acidify this, uh, this entire solution, you get um, a rearrangement yeah, of these two five-membered rings into a six-membered ring and a five-membered ring. Now, how, how, does this, how does that work? Well, in principle, in the presence of uh, a protic acid, you turn one of these OH groups into a good leaving group. Yeah? So it means you will generate here Your OH plus, yeah, so this is a good leaving group, and now we can form a carbon oxygen double bond and a new carbon carbon bond, yeah, kicking out here our leaving group, yeah, which will give us then a five membered ring and a six membered ring. So um, yeah, the pinnacle rearrangement effectively converts our 1,2 dialcohol, yeah, our 1,2 diol 
into a carbonyl compound. So in the next lecture, we'll be looking at further radical reactions and one particular process which is industrially um, of extreme importance and uh, produces all the plastic which surrounds us, namely radical polymerizations. See you next time.